hey there guys and welcome back. On this week's show, five more tips and tricks to make your day in the shop just that much more enjoyable. Well, to date, I have done five of these, and they have met with such wonderful response from all of you that I thought I would bring you another one today. So, here we are, tips and tricks number six. And it all starts off over at the bench with some screws. Well, we're talking about screws on our first tips for today, and they come in a variety of shapes, sizes, uh, different styles, countersink, pan, tapping, self-tapping, all kinds, drywall, you name it. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple tips here on screws. And for starters, a lot of people don't know how they're measured in length. And... The way it works is that a screw is measured in length from the point in time that it sits flush to your stock. In other words, if you have a screw such as this one here that is a countersink, the screw is measured from the end here or the flat section that will sit flush to your wood to the point. So on this particular screw, if we measure that, this one here is an inch and a half. So this is an inch and a half long screw. However, in the case of, let's say this pan screw here, where it is not meant to be countersunk, the measurement is taken from the flat edge of the screw where it's going to sit flush on the stock. So if I take the measurement of this one, this one is a one inch screw. Can you see that there? So this one here, if I measure, because it's a countersink, it will get measured from the flat part where it sits flush to the wood. This as well is a one inch screw. But if we physically compare them, one of them is longer than the other because they are measured to, uh, to the standard of the amount of material that sinks into your wood is the measurement of the screw, not the overall length. So that's something to keep in mind for projects when you're deciding on how to measure screws. Now, the big thing here is the gauge of screws. And for some of us, myself included, I have one of these. And this is the most handy thing ever, and it's a screw gauge. It checks the gauge of your screws, the length of your screws, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, as well as give you the pilot hole sizes. Screw gauges are measured by the shank of the screw. That is what tells you what size they are. Now, this here I can tell by looking at it is a number eight screw. If I put it in there, the shank fits tightly in the number eight hole. It will not fit in the number six hole. It's just too tight. And the number 10 hole, it's sloppy, very sloppy, very loose. But what if you don't have one of these fancy gauges? How can you tell what gauge your screw is? It's simple. The screw heads on screws, for the most part, are the same size for each gauge of screw. It doesn't matter if the screw is one inch, two inch, three inches long, the head size is the same. So watch this, this is a cool little trick. So if we measure across to give us the uh, diameter of this screw, Measure it in sixteenths of an inch. So we'll measure across here. We have five sixteenths. That is the size or the diameter of this screw. So take that number five in the sixteenths. You have five sixteenths and double it. We now have ten sixteenths and subtract two. You're left with eight. This is a number eight screw. We've already proven that with the gauge. So let's put that aside and we'll take this screw here, which is longer than the one that we just measured. It doesn't matter if we measure the diameter of that head here. There we are again. There is five sixteenths. Double it is 10. 
take away two to number eight screw. Let's try it with this one, this little brass screw. So if we measure across the head on this one, it's a quarter inch, but we have to measure in sixteenths. So that's four sixteenths. Double it is eight. Take away two is six. It's a number six screw. Number six gauge. How about this one here? We'll do the same thing. We'll measure this one. Ah, this one here, the head is bigger. We have three eighths, which is six sixteenths. Double it, that's 12. Take away two is a number 10 screw. It's that simple. So guys, if you're not sure, let's do it with this tiny one. Let's test the theory. This is a little tiny one. Here we have it's 3 sixteenths. Double it is six. Take away two. There you go. It's a number four screw. It works 99% of the time, regardless of the style of screw. For the gauge of screw, the heads are the same size. So if you're not sure, measure the diameter, double the numerator, and subtract two to get the gauge on your screws. Well, the next tip of the day involves one of the most neglected hand tools in the shop, the block plane. Guys, these tools are fantastic. If you have a good quality block plane, they are priceless. Um, but they're not just for things like cleaning up end grain and trimming and fine tuning those joints that you make. What if I told you that you could give yourself a square edge on a board and use your block plane as a jointer? Let me show you how. So what I have is a scrap block of mahogany and it doesn't have to be mahogany. It can be anything, any hardwood, whether it be maple, walnut, you, you name it. You can even use plywood if you want. But what I've done is I have cut a rabbit in this block of wood. It is a quarter inch deep and I think it's about an inch and three eighths across here. What is the point of that rabbit? Well, the point for that rabbit is to use it against your plane, because what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a fence. So what you need to do is you need to place your mahogany board or whatever species onto your plane, and we are going to clamp it onto the body of our plane just like that. This will act as a fence. The reason for the rabbit is to get it past your area of your sole here where there is no blade. This way, the entire blade is being utilized from the fence out. And from there, we can use this as a jointer. So let me show you how to do that. Well, you take that little fence that we made, place it on your block plane, just like this, and clamp it to the sole of your plane just like that. Now, placing your plane on your board, use the fence as your guide against the side of your board. Don't use your plane. And by holding that there, you can take passes across and eventually it will plane it down to be square. Now, what you can do to see your progress it's just scribble a line all the way across the top. And once you get that done, we can plane it until it's square. And it doesn't take many passes before you can get the edge of that board to be square. So if you don't have a jointer and you're doing panel glue ups where you need the edges to be square surfaces, don't discount using a fence and your block plane to square up the edges of those boards. 
So now you're doing a panel glue up. You've squared up your edges, whether you used a block plane or not, doesn't really matter, but you're trying to clamp your panels together. And more often than not, quite a few times I'd say, after you clamp your panels together, no matter how square the edges are, once you apply pressure, you get that bowing effect. Um, sometimes it's extreme, sometimes it's only minor, but one of the major causes of that can be, not always, but can be uneven pressure applied on your clamp sometimes whether your jaw is not seating properly or that sort of thing but it was applying pressure on different areas of the surface of the edge of your board forcing it to come up or down or whatever the case may be well a little trick that you can do maybe try it on your next glue up to alleviate that is you take a piece of dowel that is the same thickness as the boards that you are gluing up and instead of placing the clamp surface onto the edge of your board, what you want to do is place the dowel in between the clamp pads and your glue up, just like that. And what that does is when you apply the pressure from your clamps, no matter whether it's uneven or not, if it has more clamping pressure at the top or the bottom or what have you, makes no difference because the actual pressure of the clamp is being applied now to the center of the board. Because of the shape of the dowel, it's applying direct pressure to the center of the board. So if you place a dowel on either side, you will even out your pressure and in most cases, you will flatten out your board and make it so that it's not bowing. Um, there are other ways to alleviate that, but this one here is by far one of the simplest to even out your clamp pressure. If you don't have dowels the same size as your board, don't worry about it. Uh, you can take a scrap of the same board and using a router and a round over bit, round it over so that uh, your pressure is now being applied in the middle. So there you go. With glue ups that you're having problems with your wood bowing, place a dowel on each end of your clamps to even out your clamp pressure uh, on your boards. Well, the next tip that I'm going to talk about today has to do with pattern transfers. And I know that on the show here, I use a lot of patterns and I show you guys how to lay down masking tape, spray adhesive, let it tack up for three minutes, etc., etc. In the case of the wood burning shows, I lay down graphite paper and trace over it to get my image onto the paper. But what if you don't want to go through all that? What if you don't have spray adhesive? What if you don't have graphite paper? Well, all you need is a photocopy and an iron. So in order to transfer your pattern, you just need to lay your print down on top of your stock. You'll take your iron on a higher heat and basically, iron your pattern onto your wood. Now you need to remember if you're doing something like lettering, you want to print it in reverse. And of course, the thicker the line, the better it's going to transfer. Thinner lines don't transfer as well, but they will transfer. You should just be able to peel off your paper here and you can see it's transferred the letters to my board. Now, I didn't let it heat all the way through there. They didn't all transfer, but you can see how it transfers the toner from your photocopy or from your printout to your board. It actually works better with a photocopier. I find that laser printing doesn't lay down enough toner to transfer really well. Um, so photocopies do work better in this instance. It's not my favorite method of transferring a pattern, but in a pinch, you can get the pattern put down onto your stock. Well, our last tip of the day has to do with square glue ups. And what it involves is some scrap pieces of half inch plywood. 
Well, this is a very simple tip and these are things that you can make with scrap plywood and have them in your shop anytime you want to do a square glue up. So I have this scrap, a half inch plywood. I have cut it so that I have at least one square edge and that's this edge here. And what I'm going to do is draw a line at one inch up from the bottom, just like that. And then one inch up from the other square edge. Simple so far, eh? And now on these marks, at the six inch mark, I'm going to square it off just like that and do the exact same thing on the opposite side at six inches. Just like that. Now, the last thing that I want to do here is I want to get a circle template and we're going to use it to round off each one of these corners here. One here and one on this side. And the very last thing that we want to do is we want to take a smaller circle. I'm just looking here. I'm going to go with half inch and we're going to place it in the corner just like that and draw a little half inch notch just like that. Now, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to take this over to the scroll saw and cut it out. And what you end up with is this. And what is the point of this other than using up some scrap half inch ply? Well, any time that you need to do a glue up, whether it be a box or whether it be, oh, I don't know, a drawer or anything where you require a square edge. Once you get your glue up done and in place and in your clamps, as an added measure and to help keep things square, all you need to do is take your little angled piece, clamp it to your glue up, just like this on the inside corner, and that will keep your assembly square at least until it sets up. Now, why that little half inch hole here in the corner? That is to avoid squeeze out. If there is any squeeze out, it's not gonna glue your clamp here or your, your little uh, plywood square. It's not going to glue it to your box or to your assembly. And you can still get in there and clean it out. If you'd like that a little bigger, make it a little bigger, but it's a great way to keep your assembly square and it's very modifiable. So if you bake smaller boxes, make smaller ones of these. The half inch plywood with the multiple plies going in opposite directions makes them very stable and really goes a long way to keeping your glue up square. So there you go. Shop made wooden square braces for your square or box glue ups. And there you have it. Five more tips and tricks to make your woodworking day just a little bit easier. Guys, some of these tips are not mind-blowing and earth-shattering. Some are just fun, quirky things that you may not have known. Sort of like the heads of screws being able to be used to measure the gauge of your screw. Um, that's not necessarily common knowledge for everybody and you may never ever ever need it. You may never ever ever use it. However, that's fun knowledge, you know. It's a little bit of extra knowledge to put in the back of your mind so that one of these days, you never know, you might think, oh, well, was that formula to figure it out? Oh yeah, measure it in sixteenths, times it by two and minus two. Easy way to figure it out. Um, some tips that I give here are nothing more than common sense. Some may or may not apply to you. The one about transferring the patterns, I'm going to say photocopiers work best. Um, the toner that is used in laser printers 
is <clears throat> it heats up a little more it seems and it really solidifies it on that paper so it doesn't transfer as well as you may have seen in the video <clears throat> but the um, toner that is used in photocopy machines is a lot more <clears throat> it's a lot more friendly to the transfer heat method than what a laser printer is um, if you are going to use your laser printer to transfer these lines my suggestion would be make sure your lines are thick. It doesn't like thin lines. It doesn't want to transfer those, but it is an option. Not my preferred one by any means, but it is an option of how to do it. As far as these little glue up squares go, these things are awesome. You can whip off a kajillion of them in an hour and have multiple sizes, multiple lengths, multiple thicknesses, um, any, uh, basically you can make as many as you want to suit the needs that you have. They are a great way to keep your glue ups square until your glue sets. How many times have you glued up a box, you checked it, it was square and somewhere along the line, something shifted. And when it was all dried, said and done, when you unclamped it and you checked it for some reason, it's out of whack these little squares will eliminate that for you and keep your glue up square until they set. It's just common sense, it's just a great little idea, but it's one that some people may not have thought of. Guys, I know that not every tip is applicable to every person, but if you could watch today's show and take away one piece of information that's new to you or one tip that would be useful to you, then the show was a total success and worth doing, and I hope that you've enjoyed it. If you haven't already, guys, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Click the bell, and then you won't miss the notifications of future episodes of the show. I hope you've enjoyed today's content. I hope you found something useful to take into your shop and make your woodworking just a little bit easier. And honestly, guys, I hope you're going to join me again next week when I bring you yet another Alternative Tuesdays. Thank you